I was a recon soldier. That was my job. That's what I did in the army. It's what I did in Iraq in, in Desert Storm. It's, it, it, so when, when I look at the enemy, I, I look for what is, the, what is the actual enemy that I'm fighting against. What does he have? What equipment is he using? What is his real power? Because in the kingdom, we can easily think we're fighting one thing when in fact it is something completely different that is actually the opponent. We are in a series called Make Your Mark. And um, this series is, um, is, is about uh, a lot of things. <laughs> it's about more, let me, let me put it this way, this series is about more than I intended it to be when we started it. Let, let's just put it, put it there, because what I intended it to be about was this, that your commitment and, uh, to God's plan and priorities will lead to a life where you can make your mark. Now, Here's the reason that it's about more, is that when you begin to make a mark, when you begin to take a stand, when, when you begin to, uh, to, to find a place and, and, and take a stand there, you will rouse the attention of the enemy. <laughs> and, and the enemy does not want you to stand. The, the enemy doesn't want you to be able to take a stand to find a place to live in confidence uh, in, in what God has called you to. And so therefore, he's going to, he's going to, try, to try to take you out. He's going to try to take you down. He's going to try to, try to disrupt that. And so I, I, today, I, w- I want to talk to you about this. Allies and opponents. That whenever you go into life, whatever you do in, a li- in, in life, you're going to you're going to have allies and you're going to have opponents. You're going to have those who are with you and trying to go with you and trying to help you along and encourage you and lift you up and equip you to be able to go and do it. And you're going to have an enemy. You're going to have opponents that are going to stand in your way, that are going to try to keep you from going where God has called you to go. And, and so this is, a, this is a very important thing to understand because here's what I also know is anytime that you preach about that we preach about spiritual warfare we get to experience spiritual warfare at its finest (laughs) right it's that's why you know preaching through Nehemiah when we use Nehemiah Nehemiah is a spiritual warfare book in the Bible and the devil doesn't like it when you open your Bible to the book of Nehemiah because the book of Nehemiah is one of those places in history, it's one of, those, one of those places marked in time where the devil lost everything, where he got beat down in a bad way. And he doesn't like to be reminded of that. But when we turn to that book, I, here's the way I, I would rather say it. When God directs us to turn to that book, because I don't turn to that book unless God directs me to. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? Because when God directs us to turn to the book of Nehemiah, I already know that, that God is about to give the devil a beatdown. But in the process of giving a beatdown, how many of you know every once in a while you take one in the chin, <laughs> right? Like, you, you, you also take your own lumps in any fight that you enter into. Uh, you might win the fight, but you won't walk away without a bruise. And it's, and it's enduring the bruises, it's enduring the fight that that will, will help us, will cause us to determine the real victory. And, and so here, here's kind of the point that I want to get to today uh, as we move through, and I'm going to move through this quickly, but when you begin to make your mark for the kingdom of God, you will attract both allies and opponents alike. There will be people that will come around you, that will lift you up, that will equip you. The Scripture says that God has already put into place people that are going to come around, that are going to equip. In in Ephesians, he says that there are are, um, apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers who are already in place, that are already there, that, that have been given to the church for the purpose of equipping the saints for the works of service. 
So our job is to, is to equip you, is to prepare you for that. One of my jobs, my, my, probably my most important job, is to equip and prepare you to do the work of the kingdom in the world. We, we've gotten this out of, out, of, out of focus in some ways in the, in the church. We've professionalized it, and we've said, oh no, it's the, it's the pastors and the teachers that do the work of the service. And we've completely ignored the other three very important functions that God has called us to, which is the apostolic calling, the prophetic calling, and the evangelistic calling. And we say, oh no, no, the pastors and teachers, they will take care of all of that. And I just, I just observe. I'm, I'm just a, a, a one who watches. Listen, no. Wrong. Like, it's, that's like joining the army and putting on the uniform and then sitting down and watching the soldiers fight. It's like, what are you doing? Right? That's, that's not how this works. When you put on the uniform, when you are clothed in Christ, you are to be on the battlefield. <laughs> you are the one that's there to fight. You are, there, you, are, you are the one that's there to, to do the works of service that God has prepared in advance for us to do. That we are saved by grace through faith for works of service. We are made, we are God's handiwork. We are His workmanship made in Christ Jesus to do the works of service that He has already pre planned and prepared for us to do. And listen, God has already pre planned and prepared you to win the battle that He knows is coming for you. You have already been prepared and, and, and equipped to be able to win that battle because God saw it coming. And, and the fact that he saw it coming means that he has already put people in place in your life and put things into your life to prepare and equip you to be able to win that battle when you get there. So when you, when you understand that, when you recognize that the calling of God, that the, the way that has been made for you to go into whatever it is that you're in has already been prepared. It's all, the, the groundwork has already been laid. And it's in the confidence of understanding God's calling in your life. Of understanding the fact that you are not here by accident. What do I mean? I mean you are not here right now in this room by accident. You are here right now in this room because God has a, a message for you. Because God has a plan for you. He knows the, the plans that He has made for you. Plans for you to prosper. What does prosper mean? It means to win. It means to win the battle. It, we, we, get, uh, you know, we think in this world prosperity only means to get more world stuff. It does mean that, but it means so much more. It means to win at the battle that you're in. It means to win what you actually, what is actually going to be a blessing to you. Listen, when we're in God's will, God is only going to bless us with what is a blessing to you. Not according to what the world thinks is a blessing to you. Because a lot of times, what the world thinks is a blessing to you is not a blessing at all. It's a curse. It will destroy you. This past week, we've seen two, at least two high-profile suicides that of celebrities that seemingly had it all, that seemingly had everything that the world could offer, a, a, a business empire. Anthony Bourdain, like many people, would look at his life and say, there is no better life you could live on this planet than to travel around the world and eat and drink and party. That's what he did. And listen, God rest his soul. I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm. It's heartbreaking when you see these kinds of things happen because you know that we, the church, we have an answer. You see, you don't get peace. You don't get peace in your heart. You don't get peace in your mind. You don't get peace in your soul by traveling around and enjoying this spinning rock in the solar system and all of the lavishness of it and all of the things that it offers, it falls short of that need that we have in our soul. 
It falls short of that God-shaped hole in our hearts that can never be filled with all of the parties and all of the food and all of the drink and all of the wine. You know, the Apostle Paul said, listen, if what we believe is not true, then we should just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. And who cares? Because it's meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. The, Ecclesi- the writer of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, the richest man on the planet, the man who owned everything and could own anything he wanted, came to his life after he had departed from the will of God. And he writes these words, that all of life and all of its treasure and everything you can pour out of it is meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. It is all vanity. And it means absolutely nothing. Nothing apart from the peace that we get through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's there that we have the hope of the world. But listen, church, it's our job to spread the hope. It's our job to spread the Word, to spread the Gospel. It is not our job to be the moral police of the world and to go tell the world all the things that's wrong with them. It is our job to spread hope and peace through the good news of Jesus Christ and the hope that we have in Him. And if we do that, we don't need to worry about telling people what's wrong with them. We tell them what's right with Jesus. And when we say what is right with Jesus, when we say, listen, yes, we're sinners. We have all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. But there is one who overrides our sin, who overrides our falling short, who overrides our weaknesses. And He did it on a cross. He gave His life up for you on a cross to defeat the enemy that has power over your life and over your mind and over your heart because you have given it to Him by doing what He wanted rather than doing what God wanted. All you have to do is turn around, repent to God, and just change your thinking. I no longer live for the world, but I live for the Lord. And it's in living for the Lord. It's in living for Him. It's in giving my life over to Him that I find peace. That I find hope. That I find love. That I find acceptance. That I find all of the things that this world is searching for in so many places, in so many ways, that just leave us high and dry and destroyed. We think what is going to save us is what is destroying us. We think that entering into relationships that we have no business being in is going to save us and give us this, the, the connection and the, and, 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 the, and the togetherness that we so hung, strangely hunger, strongly hunger, desperately hunger for, when in fact, it is that connection that can only be satisfied with one relationship And that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And it's through that connection with Jesus, through Jesus, in Jesus, that creates the other relationships and makes all other relationships rich and meaningful and matter. Because outside of that relationship, all the other relationships will just leave you hungry. It will just leave you dry and thirsty. But in that relationship, it enhances everything else that you do. Everything else that is done under the Lordship of Christ is is just increased. You want to have a better marriage? Then strengthen your relationship with Jesus. You want to have a better relationship with your kids? Then strengthen your relationship with Jesus. You want to have a better relationship with coworkers and schoolmates and, and anybody else, your neighbors, then strengthen your relationship with Jesus. Because through that, listen, strengthening your relationship with Jesus is like connecting to the source. It's like when the fire truck draw, drives up to a burning building and they get out and they connect a hose to the, the fire hydrant. Now, listen, if, if a fire truck drives up and doesn't connect to the source, it can stand there with all the hoses and axes and ladders and everything else that it wants, but it has no water to put out a fire. 
It's the moment that it connects to the source that all of a sudden it becomes great for everyone else, for everything else. It becomes effective in the, in the function that it was supposed to do in saving babies from burning buildings and, and knocking out windows and doing whatever it needs to be able to put out that fire because it's connected to the source. If you're not connected to the source, you are going to... You, you, you're, you're, <laughs> You're like that lawnmower that just ran out of gas. You're going to spit and sputter and and try, and and it's not going to work. (sighs) That had nothing to do with my sermon. No, that's not true. It had everything to do with my sermon, but it wasn't in my notes. Let me put it that way. I was going to do this quickly. All right, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10. Nehemiah is in a position where he has been called by the Lord. He has been sent into a foreign land. He has prayed for favor from the Lord and God has granted it to him through the king, Artaxerxes. And Artaxerxes has supplied him with everything that he needs to be able to do what he's been called to do. And so here Nehemiah is moving and operating in his will. Listen, here's a little side note for you too. If you've been given everything that you need to do what you feel like you're supposed to do, it's because God has given you favor and prepared the way for you. Now go do it. Now go do it. I'm just talking to me. I just. (laughs) All right. You're going to have allies and you're going to have opponents. When Samballad the Horite and Tobiah the Amorite official heard about this, they heard that Nehemiah had come and he was going to rebuild the walls and he was going to rebuild the city. They heard about this and they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Listen, always translate opposition to godly progress as a sign that you are on the right track. We, we oftentimes, we start out, we think, oh, you know, God, tell us what to do. Give us what to do. Give us a vision. Give us a mission. Let us go. And then we start out and we're like, we hit opposition. The moment that you hit opposite, woo, maybe I guess it's not the Lord's will. Wrong. That proves that it's the Lord's will. When you start moving in a godly direction, you're going to hit an enemy. There's an enemy out there that wants to kill, still kill and destroy everything that you have. And if you don't think he's real, just start moving in the, in, a, in the direction that God has told you to go. Because when you begin to move in the direction God has told you to go, you will hit an enemy. If you're not hitting the enemy every once in a while, you're probably going the same way he is. You need to turn around. That you're, in, you're in a bad position when you're not, when you're not hitting opposition. Because, but, but listen, take heart in the opposition. Understand that when you know that you know that you are in the will of God, but you're still hitting obstacles, you're still hitting challenges, that is confirmation that you are on the right track. That is confirmation that you are moving the right direction. And so when we understand that, we need to understand something about opposition. Opposition is very important to understand. I was a scout in the army. One of my jobs was to underst- my, my job was to go way out in front of everybody else, find the enemy, sneak up on them, look around at them, see what they're doing, what they have, what equipment they do, how they're maneuvering and all of that, and then report that back to the commanders so that the commanders could make a decision on how do we attack this enemy. It's called reconnaissance, right? I was a recon soldier. That was my job. That's what I did in the army. It's what I did in Iraq in, in Desert Storm. It's it, it, so when, when I look at the enemy, I, I look for what is, the, what is the actual enemy that I'm fighting against. What does he have? What equipment is he using? What is his real power? Because in the kingdom, we can easily think we're fighting one thing when in fact it is something completely different that is actually the opponent. <laughs> Opposition is not the person but the evil influencing the person. Your opposition is not the person that you seem to that, that, that you're running into. Understand that. 
The Bible says it this way in Ephesians 6, 12. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities and the uns- in the, of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. I want you to understand this, that when you, when you are dealing with other people, and, it's the, and those other people are in opposition to you, it is not that person that you're in opposition with if you are operating in the will of God. If you're operating in a godly calling in the will of God, it is not the person that you are confronting that is your enemy. It is the spiritual powers behind that person and running through that person's thought process that is causing this. And listen, if you think the enemy's not good at this, he has thousands and thousands and thousands of years worth of practice. He is very good at it. And he is very manipulative. And he can get in places that you didn't think he could even get into. And he can use things you didn't think he could use but understand this anything that is in opposition to the godly movement that you are doing now keep in mind i'm saying godly movement meaning you are operating in the will of god i'm not saying that you're just being a jerk right i mean if we're just being jerks for jesus and people are opposing us well we ought to be opposed for that right yeah i just want to clear that up so you know if i'm just out there acting like a knucklehead then I ought to get opposition, and that, that's deserved. But if you're moving in a mission, in a purpose that God has called you to, and you're getting opposition, understand, it is not that person. It is the evil powers of this dark world that has influence on our minds and on our desires and on our thoughts that cause us to try to stand in the way of... Listen, you don't have to be demon-possessed to be prompted by the enemy. 2 Corinthians verse 10 says this, chapter 10 verse 3 says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, uh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised up, raised against the knowledge of God, and they and and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Listen to what the verse says. Our weapons are not of this world. They are weapons that we have in which we have divine power to destroy strongholds. What's a stronghold? A stronghold is a place, an attitude, a thought process that we have given Uh, in our lives over to the enemy. It's that place of darkness. It's that place where we have believed the lie. It's that place where we have, where we have accepted what the world and the, and the enemy thinks over what God thinks. That's why we have to take every thought captive and test it, make it approved and obedient to Christ. Because what that does is it eliminates those strongholds, those places where the enemy can hang out. The enemy can only hang out in dark places. When we bring light into the darkness, He can't hide there anymore. And so we bring, we flood ourselves with light. And it's those divine powers that destroy those strongholds. And we destroy every argument and lofty opinion. Do anybody, does anybody in the world have lofty opinions that don't agree with God anymore today? Hashtag sarcasm. Everybody with a keyboard's got an opinion, right? Everybody on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and wherever, oh, we, we got an opinion and we think you ought to hear it. <laughs> Nehemiah 6, 2-11. through 11. I, 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 want to, I want to tell you this part, that progress is always uphill. Stop thinking it's going to be easy. Progress is always uphill and it will not be easy. If it's easy, it's probably not progress. If you're not disturbing the enemy, then you are not living to your full potential. These three guys were disturbed by what Nehemiah was doing. I love that word. (laughs) You see, sometimes we just leave the enemy laying on his lounge chair in our lives and he's got no problems because we're not disturbing him at all. 
We're not doing anything that he disagree with, agrees with, anything that he doesn't like. We're, we're not disturbing him whatsoever. But when you get up and you start moving in the direction God has called you, you will disturb the enemy. Remember that the warfare of God's people will always disturb the enemy. It's supposed to. It's supposed to. That means you're on the right track. In Nehemiah 2, 11-16, Nehemiah goes out and he surveys the walls. He surveys the mess. He looks at what's wrong. And, 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 he, and he checks out what's happening in, in, the, in the place. And, and in verse 16, he says, The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or the officials or any others who would be doing the work. <laughs> See, Nehemiah already knew who was going to be doing the work. If Nehemiah were, were, were in our day in the New Testament time, he would look at the church and he would say, I see who's going to be doing the work of the kingdom. I see who's going to be rebuilding these walls. I see who's going to restore the strength of this kingdom and rebuild these walls. I see you because you are here. This is the church. This is what we do. This is who we are. Get clear on your objective before you go public. Nehemiah wasn't telling anybody, but he was looking. He was assessing. He knew what was about to happen. And listen to what he says. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall, uh, the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God and on, uh, on me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. They replied, let us start rebuilding. You see, when we cast a compelling vision of what God is doing in our lives that is honest but is also filled with hope. It's in that honest look around our lives when we say, man, there is some rubble here. <laughs> there is some mess here. There is some broken down stuff right here. There's some broken down walls. There's some exposed places. There's some gates that have been burned where the enemy can easily get into my life and just ride on in unopposed like nothing is even there. We, we take an honest look at that. And then we look to the Lord. And we look at the gracious hand of what He has poured out on us. We look at what He has already given us to rebuild those walls in our lives. To rebuild that, that place where He is lifted up. Where He is exalted. Where He is worshipped. See, that's what Nehemiah was motivated by. Is he was building a city for God. He was building a kingdom where the Lord would be lifted up and worshipped. Are you that kingdom today? We are the temple of God. We are the ones who are lifting Him up. Who are creating that place where His praises reside. Where He is the one who is lifted on high. And praised above every other name. This is how we make our mark. We make our mark by making a place where God is alive and well where He rules from His throne of grace, where we receive our mercy and power, where He releases from and through us all the gifts and the fruit of the Holy Spirit into the world that brings light into the darkness. This is what Nehemiah was building. This is what Nehemiah was, was clear on and what he understood. I want to jump to the end. Listen, opponents will try to use lies and fear to discourage you. Don't let them. Don't let them. Lies cannot live in the presence of truth. And when you open up your Bible, when you proclaim the name of Jesus who is perfect truth, when you say the name of Jesus, the devil hears perfect truth. And the only, the only weapon that the enemy has that he can use against you that's still effective in any way whatsoever is the weapon of lies. Because if he can get you to, live, to believe a lie, he can fill you with fear. And if he can fill you with fear, he can suck away your faith. 
And the moment that you lose your faith, you stop looking to the Lord and you start running and hiding. Or you start fighting. Fight or flight response happens. I'm telling you, rise up in faith. Rise up and remember what the Lord has done. Rise up and and remember the provision and the favor that the Lord has poured out on us so that we can rebuild the walls. So that we can restore that which was broken down. So that we can, for this dark world, be a city on a hill that shines brightly for the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand together. Our God is a warrior. He fights for us. He fights on our behalf. He does battle in our name. But we get to take Him into that battle. We get to march into the devil's camp. We get to march into those places where at night the devil tries to attack you in your thoughts, in your head, in those, in those things that go through. You just proclaim the name of Jesus and Jesus the mighty warrior will rise up and fight for you. Let's just pray. Father, as we, as we just worship You in this one last song, as we sing these words of truth, We just pray, God, that You would rise a warrior up in each one of us. That You would just lift us up to be that mighty man of God, that mighty woman of God that goes on Your behalf and rebuilds and restores and delivers the kingdom until that glorious day. Lord God, we look forward to that glorious day, but we know that Your Word says that we can pray on earth as in heaven so we can live in that glorious day right here, right now, today. And so we just by faith step into what You are already in the process of making happen in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.